Hello, Fucundi here, and welcome back to Planet Zoo. And last time out, we built ourselves a walkthrough otter habitat and talked about how to create walkthrough habitats, as well as double level guest service buildings like the one we have in the background over here. Now, there was one major oversight with this habitat, and big shout out to Michael W for pointing this out, but with these signs, if you don't like how they look, which, like, let's face it, I think most of us probably won't like how they look, you can actually sink them into the ground. So if I select both of these, go to advanced move selection, and we just sink it into the surface like this. And then actually let's go to heat maps, and you can see on the security and crime tab there, the area of effect. So you can sink them into the ground, and they're still going to work <laughs> from a guest point of view in terms of making sure that they're being quiet and not disturbing the animals and also not dropping that litter. So let's sink them under the ground like this. We'll click OK, and then that's covering a decent proportion of our habitat. And then same goes for these signs over here. So we'll grab both of these. Let's go to Advanced Move, and we'll just sink them into the ground like that. And then we'll move them so it's covering more of this pathway area. And I'm thinking, because we've got this whole area in the middle as well, let's click tick on that. Then let's grab, if we can grab both of these now, we probably can't. So let's go back to these ones and see if we can more easily pick up these. Yes, we can. Let's duplicate those and then let's put them in the middle here as well so we'll sync them in there let's get rid of the heat map a second i'll grab these and just go to advanced move click x on your keyboard and just sync them into the ground so we can't see them wonderful <laughs> absolutely wonderful now these ones actually aren't sunk far enough so let's just adjust those and yeah they'll still have those area of effects so they still work and you don't have to look at them so wonderful, wonderful tip there from Michael W. Thank you so much for that. And if you have other suggestions and things that I've missed, keep them coming in the comments. So for today, we're actually going to be focusing on this little area here. And I'm going to be talking about two things. Firstly, the use of invisible paths that you can use to kind of get really quite creative with little picnic areas, which we're going to come on to in just a second. But the main focus today is going to be a mixed animal habitat. So if we come into our Zoopedia and you look at different animals, there is a tab here which is Interspecies Enrichment. And you can see where animals can actually be in the same habitat happily with another animal. Of course, if you're on Sandbox, you could change your settings so that you could put in zebras with cheetahs <laughs> and have a lot of fun with that. But of course, we're playing franchise setting mode, so all the animal welfare, etc. needs to be on point and as the game intended. So. We could put aardvarks in with meerkats, for instance. And you can have a look through, and there's a lot of animals won't have any interspecies relationships. Some will have lots. So if you look at the Asian small cost otter, of course, we've already put those in. They could be in with any of these. So we've got quite a variety of animals in here. But say we wanted to put them in with the orangutan and the Indian rhinoceros, you need to be a little bit careful with this, because if we click on the orangutan, go to interspecies, they can't live with the rhinoceros. So you do need to be checking every animal that you choose. So we couldn't do those three together, even though the otter would be happy with those three all in together because the orangutan and the rhinoceros would not be happy. So do keep an eye on that when you're choosing which species to put into the same habitats. But the one that I have chosen to do today is actually going to be a raccoon and a striped skunk because I think they go quite well together. So if we have a look at the raccoon, they're least concerned, they're not particularly endangered. Uh, they're quite small animals as well. So if we go to the natural habitat, you'll see North America, obviously. Uh, they don't need a huge amount of space. They need a bit of climbing and they need a bit of water. And of course, like because they can climb, we need to make sure that we've got really good high climb proof barriers there. In terms of group sizes, it's not too many. So it's only up to five adults and they have between two and four babies per mating event. So they don't need a massive amount of space. So if we come back to here, we can say, OK, we've got the maximum adults and let's say the maximum babies. We're only talking 480 metres and very small water. 40 metres is not a big patch of water. So don't go overboard with that. Now, if we come to the striped skunk, again, they're not very endangered. So these animals won't be like a massive highlight of the zoo. I wouldn't expect huge crowds to be gathering there once we've got things like lions or elephants into the zoo, which are going to be much, much more popular. 
Um, but again, they're, they're North America, so they're the same region. So I think they do go together really quite nicely. And also they don't need a lot of space either. So if we go to the species data, we're only talking one male and one female in each habitat. And they actually can have between one and five babies. So let's say we have the maximum again on these. You're talking 327 meters, which is a tiny space. Honestly, <laughs> you'll easily get that through any habitat. And actually skunks can't climb, so barrier requirements. We'll have to focus on the raccoon for that because they've got much more stringent requirements there. Now, the one thing with space here is they don't like add up incrementally. So if we added this many skunks at 327 and the raccoons, are, well, I think it was around 500, we're not going to need 800 metres of space. And I'll show you that once we add them in. So you don't need to sit there and think, oh, I need a habitat which is a thousand metres squared. You absolutely don't. I don't know exactly what the maths is to work it out, but... I'd say when you're putting interspecies in is, is get them into a basic habitat, see what the size is, and then adjust it as you need afterwards. Obviously, if you're keen to make it as small as possible, land tax based on habitat size is quite big. So you don't want to overdo the size of your habitats because that will impact you financially. So yeah, these are the animals that we're going to go for. And I have already got raccoons up here. We're really lacking on conservation credits. Now, one thing we can do to help that, you will remember with our exhibits, is we set them up to automatically store animals when they had babies, so they get rid of, I think, the oldest animal, the least appealing. So in our exhibit trading, you need to check this periodically, we do actually have two snakes in here now. And if we click on these, you can see we can quick trade this one out of the zoo for some money. That's obviously one that we had bought as opposed to being bred in this zoo. And this one we can actually release to the wild for conservation credits. So, oh... We suddenly got another one. We've got, <laughs> we got a sloth in here as well. So again, this will be one that we've bought that can't be released for conservation credit. So again, that's just a quick trade for a bit of money. So let's definitely release this one to the wild. And we'll take our six conservation credits from that. And then let's grab these two and we'll just do quick trade out of the zoo. So you want to keep... Oh my goodness, <laughs> we've got absolutely loads coming in here. We must be having babies left, right and centre. <laughs> So again, we'll have a look at these. All of these are just quick trade for cash. So let's go ahead and we'll do that. Can I undo? Yes, that's fine. We'll quick trade those out of here. So keep an eye on this when you've got exhibit species in, because for some of the animals, this will fill up very rapidly. There's some of the frog species where you're going to get endless amounts of babies in here. So do keep an eye on it. And that will help with your conservation credits and money as well if you need it. And just a quick note as well on animals. You'll see here, if we go to our African penguins... Is that nine? That's not 94 penguins. I'm going to say that's an awful lot. But the African penguins are one of the best species you can get for getting conservation credits because look how many babies we have got from just a few adults. So when these babies have grown up, we can release these to the wild for a lot of conservation credits. Each one could get you anywhere between 150, 200, sometimes even more, actually, depending on the rating for them. So it's definitely worth keeping an eye on. Oh, we've got a gold baby there as well. That's quite exciting. So once they start to grow up, we don't want the habitat to be too overcrowded, although you can have hundreds and hundreds of penguins in one habitat, particularly because ours is so large. But that's another thing to keep an eye on to boost your conservation credits as well. Um, but coming back to animal trading, we do have some, so we could potentially spend 22 conservation credits on this one. I'm actually just going to have a look at the skunk as well, because I want to see if any of these are going to require conservation credits. And actually, we've got quite a good female here. Let's just go back to the Zoopedia and check on maturity age. So they only live to eight years old. Yeah, so they're not, they're, they don't live a huge amount of time. 14 years for the raccoon. Okay, so we want to keep an eye on the age that we're getting them at. So actually two years is fine and she's a bronze rated skunk. So I think let's go ahead and adopt her for some cash. She seems to be better actually than the one that's asking for conservation credits. And then in terms of the boys, it's slim pickings. <laughs> so we might want to wait a little bit to pick our boy skunk and see what comes out. Let's go back and choose our raccoons here. So I think we probably can afford to spend some conservation credits. Her fertility is quite a bit higher. And actually, we do want to have really ideally two females and two males just to make this habitat a little bit more exciting. And that will also give us a better chance of having babies that we then don't need to go and buy new animals to avoid inbreeding for as well. So I think we will actually go ahead and get both of these. Let's get the one for cash because she's not too bad. We'll refresh the list. 
then we can compare these two. The one for cash, actually, the immunity and the longevity is quite a lot better, although the fertility is a bit lower. So I think we're actually going to go for the one for cash and we'll save our conservation credits there. And then let's have a look at the males and Noah is definitely seeming like a better choice there. So we'll get that, refresh the list and see what comes up. And again, if you're on franchise, this list is going to be random. Sometimes you will have animals, sometimes you won't. And honestly, it might just be a bit of a waiting game to get one at the right price for you. And Jason here is looking pretty good too. So let's adopt him. So we go to our animal storage now. Yeah, we've got our female skunk. We do need the male skunk in. So let's go back and see how long we're going to have to wait. We've got six minutes and seven minutes. I think we'll wait because neither of those are particularly good. So having waited, we do now have a better male available. This one's still pretty pants. <laughs> And I keep getting warners, warnings about keepers cannot reach exhibits. They definitely can. I'm not really sure why that is. They do go away pretty quickly, but uh, some of the warnings you have to kind of ignore a little bit. But yeah, let's get this skunk here. And so now we've got all of our animals in our trade center. Let's click them all and we're going to say send to zoo. And we're going to go and find our quarantine, which is all the way over here. And we'll place them in there. So they'll be nicely sitting in quarantine where we can go and set up our habitat barriers. Okay, so how I would like to do this, I'm going to use a null barrier for this for the moment. And um, we're going to make sure that it's on eight meters. I'm going to do lots of building pieces around this because my general idea for this is thinking about raccoons in particular and skunks to a point. A lot of them live in kind of urban environments or suburban environments in North America. So I'm kind of thinking what I'm going to do is create a couple of houses and have the skunks and the raccoons living in their back gardens, basically. And that's how we're going to kind of set this up as a little bit of a themed area. So it should be kind of fun to do. So I definitely want to make sure that we're using eight meters for our barriers or, or multiples of four at least, which will make the building process much, much easier, particularly if you're not super comfortable with all of the building aspects. So I'm going to make sure angle snap is on as well. And we're going to place in four lots of eight meters as our diameter there and then three going backwards like this. And then again, we'll come across four like that and down three. So we've got a very square, quite boring habitat. But of course, we're going to make this a lot more interesting than what it looks like now. Now, let's actually just go ahead and select the whole thing because it's not really nice and central in the middle of this gap here. So I definitely want it to be. And we're going to click this and hold and we can drag it into the position that we want. So I'm kind of thinking like that would be quite good. Now, of course, we do want a path running along the front of it. So let's also think about that. And I think a six metre path will be fine for this. Like I said, I don't think they're a massively attractive animal. So having a super wide path isn't that necessary. And what we want to try and do, I'm going to turn off angle snap actually for this. We're holding Z on the keyboard, if you remember, to get nice angles coming off our path here. And that feels pretty good. We'll turn back on angle snap so it runs nice and straight along the front of our habitat here and then yes we can connect it in that side no problem at all and then if we want to get just nicer smoother corners we have to find a point like that put in a piece of path and then right click to delete it and of course that corner is not going to go in nicely so we're going to undo that see if we can do it again although i have a feeling our path com path network is coming a little bit too complex here for the game's liking unfortunately Oh no, we have managed it. There we go. So it's a bit of trial and error with these things. That's a little bit smoother there. Let's go ahead and see if we can do the same thing. I think this side is going to be tricky. Let's actually just go to a smaller four meter path and see if we can just connect it up like that, which will help with the smoothness. Can we get in that corner now? We can't. We can get there. We'll smooth that bit out. Okay, well, that's not too bad. We'll smooth it there. That feels a little bit more flowy. Can we do an extra piece? Oh, we can. There we go. Now in the middle here, this is the next thing that I do want to talk about today. If we go into our paths, we have got these kind of invisible paths here. So if we go with this one, a natural path with curb markers, don't worry about the curb markers for now. What I'm actually going to do is make it super duper wide. We'll go for 10. And I'm literally going to place this in, in the middle of this area. Now that is not going to go in particularly nicely. Let's maybe just dial down the size of the path here. 
If you hit control as well, you will remember it won't snap onto the paths that are there. Yeah, that's not too bad. And then we'll see if we can snap it in without kind of interrupting the concrete path too much. This is what I want for this area. That is generally okay. Can we forge another connection here? We can. So the edges of the concrete path are a little bit dodgy, but we can cover that up with a bit of detailing. But what it does mean is we have these invisible paths in here and we can create a really nice picnic area with this. So if we go and just copy the picnic bench that we're using within this zoo, you'll see it won't go on non-pathed areas. So this is why we're having to put this path in here. And of course, just one point as well with the path, you need to remember in the settings to come in here and turn off curb on ground path. If you leave that on, you'll see you get these curb markers. So you kind of don't get that same sort of picnic area vibe that we're trying to go for here. So we're turning that off in those settings. So now let's come back, reselect our picnic bench. We'll copy that and then we can just place a few of these in here, like a very kind of open picnic area. And you see, if you get too close to the barriers, they will go red, so you won't be able to put them in. But we'll flick a few of them around because I want it to feel quite nice and natural. And I definitely don't want it to feel like a path, <laughs> if that makes sense. So we're going to dot these in in a few random locations. And we can, might actually be able to smooth this out to give ourselves a little bit more space. Let's go back down to a width of four so it's a little smaller. And in the same way that we do other paths, delete that out. There we go. You see, we've got more space with that now too. And then that does mean we can add in potentially a couple more picnic benches like that. Now, we are obviously going to get people walking through here, which is fine. <laughs> it's fine. But what we do get is a nice little open picnic area, a grass picnic area, which is you can't really achieve any other way without these natural unmarked path areas. So I feel like that's quite good. And then we can, of course, come in with a bit of nature and start you know, putting in a few bushes around it, trees, etc., to make this feel a little bit more alive. So let's actually go to temperate plants here and see if we can find a nice tree to put around this. So something like the Aleppo pine might be quite nice here. And we can, of course, put it in the middle of the path as well if we want to. So don't forget that. And I think, in fact, actually, we will do that in this case. Let's have a nice shady tree in the middle of our little picnic area like that. Then we can see if we can find some smaller trees to put around the outside. Yeah, beach sapling wouldn't go too amiss. So coming back to our habitat and what I am going to do is actually upgrade these null barriers to something that's not climbable for a, a moment. So the red brick is not climbable. Let's upgrade this entire thing. OK, so our path has come a little bit too close here annoyingly to upgrade it to the red brick. So let's just move this point in a tiny bit for a second and we can upgrade those because what I do want to do is just check that this habitat size is OK for our animals before we proceed on any further. So I'll put in the gate there. Let's just grab a very small staff path for that like this. And then, of course, we'll go to our barriers. Let's edit barrier here. We'll select the entire thing and then we need it to be three metres. We'll just go to 3.5 to make sure that the raccoons don't escape. And then let's go to our zoo and let's find our raccoons and our striped skunks. Let's select all of those and say move and we'll select this habitat area here. Now I'm just going to whack it up to fast forward. We'll get the animals in and then we'll check that it's an OK size before continuing on with the build. So here they come. Is that all of them? We've got both our striped skunks in and we do have all the raccoons. So, OK, let's pause because they have absolutely no food. <laughs> and what we can do is click on an animal and then we go to terrain. And yes, you can see it is plenty, plenty big enough for what they need. So that was the skunk saying 49. If we go to a raccoon, they will say exactly the same thing. Obviously, they do need climbing and water in addition to that as well. So we need to bear that in mind. But we've got plenty of wriggle room there for building assets and foliage and things like that to take up a bit of room. So all in all, that's looking pretty good. And now I am going to leave this on pause <laughs> because we're going to go back to the barriers and we're going to convert them back to null like that. And then I'm actually also going to delete out these two sections of barriers and put them back in so it's nice and perfectly at a nice right angle and in with our big square here for building round. 
Now, we definitely don't want to press play because <laughs> they will escape. But what we can do now is start to design our habitat. So like I mentioned with this one, I did want this to feel like a street, almost a row of houses with the raccoons and the skunks living in their back garden. So I started this off by building the frames for the houses and then worried about the kind of the actual habitat barriers <laughs> and the security for the raccoons climbing out afterwards. And I didn't want it to just be like a straight row of, of the same height of houses, the same type of brick. I wanted it all look different and unique and different sizes. So positioning them so that some of the houses were further back or further forward than the others. I do later add on a conservatory to the red brick house on the end as well and make that a slightly taller height, which I think just helps to add to the interest and the realism of it. So things like that you can definitely consider. Different roofs for each house as well. So adding variation rather than just having a big flat kind of wall in the background with the windows and the doors and things like that added on. And you'll see later on in the time lapse as well, I do add in some shop window fronts, which we do later on add climbing apparatus too for the raccoons to climb through. Again, just adding a little bit more interest to just this basic front. Because the danger with this, of course, as well, is that I've got a lot of space behind here that guests can't see into which isn't always ideal. So we want to make sure that the front is exciting, has got all of the enrichment items in as well, which of course we'll come on to later on too, but that they can also see through into the back. So with the conservatory area, for example, we break down that brick wall and we put archways through so the guests could technically see through there. It would be a little bit difficult because the animals are small, but they can see through. Same goes with the other houses, providing access through to those back rooms. And actually, one thing that I do not talk about in this episode, which I have done, is added in a webcam into the back area so that guests can actually see the webcam and see the raccoons and the skunks in their little sleeping area inside the houses. So it's not completely shut off from the guests. But I have also tried to keep this building as simple as possible so that you can follow along if you would like. Everything is built off of one group, so one kind of grid pattern used for this entire building lot. And we're making the buildings too deep as well, which really helps with roof design, which is an important aspect as well, which can get quite complex. So this is the easiest way to build your houses like this. And then you're not having to worry about middle sections or things like not fitting in perfectly, because when you're using pitch roofs, having a too deep building or a four deep or multiple of twos at least is definitely the easiest way to go for this. And when you're adding on the roof, remembering the little roof overlays as well, the extensions onto the side of it really, really help to add realism. Don't forget those.
So as you can see, we are building out a cage front, very similar to what we did in a small part of the Lima area, you may remember from a few episodes ago. But with this, we do now, since I built the Lima habitat, have this option to turn off climbing. So when we're clicking on some of the beams that were previously climbable, we can now remove that element from them. So you can see me doing that here. And once we've removed the climbing element from one piece, if we then take that piece and, and use Control X to copy it and move it into place, the new piece that we put in will then be not climbable as well. So you can see that here whilst I repeat these wooden beams along the edge of this cage area. And again, just to say we are building out one section of it and then we're going to copy and paste it across the whole thing. Don't try building the whole thing from hand. It's such a huge <laughs> time saver to do it this way. But you see once we've put those in now, if I click on those, they're all non-climbable. So that will copy across if you've done it on one piece. The other way you can do it is for the entire building, which I'll show you at the end of this time lapse as well. So if you've forgotten that, it's a very easy fix afterwards. If you just click on the group of building elements that you've put in, you can change those to be non-climbable. So don't worry if you do forget. Okay, so we've got the basic setup of our habitat and of course what we do want to do is come in and you will need to press play just for a second once you put in scenery or change any habitat barriers just to let you know but we'll click on our raccoon because the raccoon is all that can climb so that's the one i'm most concerned about and we're going to come into here and click on the habitat heat map and just check that there are absolutely no points of escape within this habitat which there appears not to be. <laughs> so that is good news. That is good news indeed. So yeah, it looks like our cage is secure. And obviously the key thing being that these have climbing disabled on all of these objects. And you can actually do it as a group as well. So you'll see like here, I click this on as a group. If I said climbing enabled, let's go back in and we click on an individual beam. You'll see that that has now been enabled. If I click play for a second, then we'll click on our raccoon again. Hopefully that hasn't given them time to escape. We'll go to our habitat area. And actually they still can't escape, which is interesting. <laughs> but they should be able to, is ultimately the point within that. Like our lemurs did a few episodes ago. So we definitely want climbing disabled on all of our scenery objects here. And now you may notice as well off camera, I have actually added in a little staff room. Just in another building here. It's completely undecorated inside. Obviously no one would see inside, but we've got a little staff room. Again, to kind of add to that effect of this little village over here, because we're going to have our lake front is the plan in front of it. So when you're sat up the top at the plaza looking down, you'll be able to see this kind of little row of village houses, the other side of the lake, which I think will be quite nice here. So I want to do some kind of street detailing along the front, maybe some plant pots and a cobblestone street or that sort of thing, which we'll come on to another time. But before we can really click play, we do need to make sure that it is covered by staff. So if we come into our staff, tab here and go to work zones. Now we do have a work zone for the mandrels, which is the habitat right here. And the staff entrance for it, if you may remember, is through this cave this side. So it's actually really close to the staff entrance for the raccoons over here. So I'm actually going to edit this one. So we're going to go to edit work zone here and you can see what's included in it. The green is just in this work zone and no others. Blue in work zones and others. So you can see we've got a keeper hut, another keeper hut randomly, and a staff room here. We're going to deselect all of those so we don't have those. And we're going to choose this keeper hut, this staff room, and we're also going to add in the raccoons and skunks if we can. There we go. So that they are all just one work zone here. So let's rename this to mandrels and we'll call it raccoons. The skunks may not get a look in on this one. I'll just check that I've actually spelt that correctly. 
I have. <laughs> I have a bad time with spelling. And then what we do want to do as well is I want to have a keeper for each of these because that's three animals. We've got enough budget going on here that it's not so much of a problem. So let's just add in our keeper like that. Go back into our zoo. Uh, we need to click play just to let the keeper land and kind of actually be in the zoo. And then we can just click on them here and go to work zone and let's assign to mandrels and raccoons. And interestingly, they're called Robin White. <laughs> I quite like that. Another take on the Bob naming convention that we started early on in this series. Uh, the other thing I have added just off camera is a bit of flooring in here. So we've got a nice concrete floor in here. And the way I did that, just as a reminder, is to split it. So place it as part of the group so it's nicely in the grid. Then split it from the group. So you can do that if I click on it here. Split from group. And then use advanced controls to move it right down into the ground as low as you can get. So it still shows, but we've still got little paws sitting on top of the concrete, which is quite important to me. And then you can go ahead and add to that group and fill out the area. And I've also just added in a couple of little patio areas outside the front of some of these houses, which I thought was quite a nice little touch there. So now we've got our keeper and we do want to look after the animals needs. So if we come in to habitat here, what I have done is added raccoon and striped stunk, skunk using our filters. So all of these things will be applicable to both animals. Thankfully, like because they can go in the same habitat as one another, they kind of need similar things. So that's good to know. So first up water, I am going to put in a water pipe and I'm going to hide it back here. So I think we'll just have it in the middle of the habitat like that. Uh, a place that they can go and get water. Annoyingly, that has destroyed our concrete. So I don't know if we can just click on it, go to advanced move and try and fix that a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Just lowering it a tiny bit into the ground. It should still be absolutely functional. We can click on it, click play accessible there we go so that's absolutely fine like that and we've still got our concrete floor in and then for food we definitely want a large food bowl for them uh we want it somewhere where the guests can see so i'm thinking somewhere out the front here and maybe and maybe right in the center might be quite nice for that so let's have a think about the gardens because i do want to put kind of little fence dividers in here obviously that the animals can climb through go under in terms of the skunk so they need to be able to access the entire habitat, but we'll do some detailing like that. So I think let's put it right in the middle of this middle house here. And that'll be a nice focal point that the guests can easily see the animals eating their food there. Now, if we go to enrichment items, let's start off with food enrichment. So we've got a few little things here, actually, like a little slow feeder. And because this habitat has quite a lot of indoor space in it, which is not that visible from the guest point of view, like they can see into the conservatory back through here. You can't see into these parts, but it's not hugely visible. I'm going to keep all of the enrichment outside so that we can try and encourage the animals to be out here. So let's plop this slow feeder down on our patio over there. Uh, let's have a bamboo feeder, maybe right on this corner here. Let's do that and we'll sink that into the ground just a tiny bit just to get rid of that plate so that we can't see that. There we go. That's much better. And I don't know if we want a rolling feeder as well. We could potentially have that. Let's just see if we rotate it. Can we add it to this corner here? Yes, we can. So yeah, so we'll sit that in there. Then if we go to toys, there's a whole variety of it. But I'm going to come back to that in a second because we do need climbable elements for our raccoons. And you may have seen I've left these holes <laughs> in our scenery here, kind of acting as where windows might be, but hopefully so that raccoons can indeed climb through it is what I'm hoping here. So what I do want is a couple of little climbing platforms right next to these windows. So I think we'll do it so that it's kind of sitting either side. And it doesn't need to be massive. I don't know if four metres is probably a little bit excessive for this. So let's line it up nicely to our wall and we'll just sit it on the base of these windows here. So I have one like that and then let's click Control X on the object and advance move it over here. And we'll just sit it up next to that window there like that. Then, of course, we need climbable elements that they can get up to this. So I'm thinking like a log in the middle. So let's click X now that we've got that into position. We'll hold that there and scooch that down so that's all the way into the ground like that. So they can climb up there. And it could be fun to add some other little elements to it. So I'm thinking maybe another climbing platform over here. So let's go to advanced move. 
So we'll hold X now that it's nicely lined up to the wall with angle snap on. We can get that perfectly aligned. And then let's also flip it around this way, I think. Then if we have that sitting slightly above this window, just alongside there, like that, then we should hopefully be able to add in a small ramp for them. I think we need to use a smaller section for this. So let's actually take off a line to surface for the moment. Let's spin it around like that. Then we'll go to advanced move and let's just flick it up at an angle and then try and move it into place. Now this is the this is the where the multi-directional movement actually comes in super duper handy because we can then move it how we want across a couple of dimensions at a time, which is very, very useful indeed. You just have to make sure you're clicking the right dimensions, which is the thing that I have probably struggled with most. <laughs> yeah, so we can put that in. I'm thinking like that. Click tick, and then we'll just add in a second one. Potentially, actually, we just do a smaller one. Yeah, to feed it down onto this platform like that. And then they should be able to climb up there and off that way. And then we could just have one more little feature to it, which is another, which is another slope for them to climb up like that and that should give quite a nice climbable element i think what might be nice is to duplicate these as well so let's highlight both of those Control x now i'm going to move the red and the blue axes so it's the same height but then we can just move it onto this corner like that and that kind of frames the doorway as well so that looks quite nice i think now if we just click play a little bit let's go to our raccoons so yeah, they're actually pretty close on the climbing element like that. So we probably need a little bit more in here, um, but that will be easier to easy to achieve in this side because I think we'll certainly add some beds in and the such like. So if we go back to habitat, we can start to add in some bedding this side. And I'm kind of wary of putting climbable elements too close to the actual barrier walls on the outside. So I think what we will do, let's turn off angle snap so we can get this in perfectly, is actually place these this side <laughs> and try and avoid any animal escaping disasters this time round versus our lemurs as you may remember from a few episodes ago they're a bit naughty those although it does seem to have stopped actually i haven't even had any penguins escape recently which has made a nice change so we can have a few kind of small bedding areas like that which will all add to the climbable element and in fact actually can we make that double layer so yeah from there they can climb up from that bottom bunk onto the top and we can also just check that. So let's go to, let's find a raccoon. We'll click on them. We'll go to habitat. Then you can see where they can climb. So yeah, they can climb up. Absolutely. They can't climb up this one, actually. That's interesting. Not sure why that would be. And yeah, they can climb inside. So if we just check that, yeah, they're at 50 over 35 now. So that's actually plenty. I'll probably add in a few more little low bedding areas in the inside because that will make it more interesting in here. Um, because then on that as well, we can go to beds and shelters and start to add just some very small little bedding areas. Now, this actually isn't wide enough, so I think what I might do is actually place these underneath here. Almost like they're hidden away underneath that little shelf there. It's already small animals. I think that'll make a nice touch. And we can do some bigger bedded areas in other places like this, and that will work for the skunks as well. Well, that should be pretty good on the enrichment front. Oh, they need toys, of course. Let's go back. So let's go back to enrichment items and go to toys now, and we can just add in a few various ones of these. So yeah, the raccoons are now 100% enrichment. So let's find a skunk, if we can, <laughs> and check them. So yeah, they're at 100% enrichment as well. They're a little bit stressed. They have got places to hide, though. So I don't know why they're so stressed. Wow, that was a violent, <laughs> that was a violent throw over the raccoon there. <laughs> right, so the final thing we need to do before we come on to detailing it up is making sure that their terrain uh, is nice. Now, the raccoons do need water. The skunks do not. They do not need much water. We're talking 25 metres. So what I'm thinking is in this back garden of this house, I quite like to add a pond, although that raccoon has now put the bull there. <laughs> we'll have to move that in a second. So let's go to push. Let's make sure our intensity isn't too high for this. And we're just going to create a very, very small little pond because you'd be amazed at how small 25 metres actually is when you put it in. 
So we'll put in a bit of calm water there. Actually, I'm not too keen on that big kind of bump in the middle. So let's just push that down a little bit further. And we've got a tiny bit of water. They don't need deep water, so shallow is absolutely fine. And that's actually bang on 25 metres. So let's make it just a tiny bit bigger to allow for when we have babies or a higher population in here. So that's now 37 out of 25, which is plenty more than needed to allow for extra babies. So we've got lots of room and lots of space to detail with now. Now, the final thing is, of course, checking terrain requirements, but thankfully both of these animals are actually really similar and they're both absolutely fine from that respect. So we're all good there. We definitely can't have any more grass long or any more rock. So that's something to bear in mind when we come to detail, but we can definitely add a bit more soil for both of these. If we want to around plants when we come to add them in. So that's something to bear in mind. And yeah, I do wonder if we should reduce the number of guests in our zoo because the crowds are becoming quite horrible. <laughs> Actually, I went in the sloth habitat earlier and it was absolutely jam-packed. It would not have been a very fun zoo experience, to be honest. So that's something to consider too. But it is now time to come on and detail up here. So we'll be adding in lots of foliage and thankfully both of these animals have a really wide range from quite low to very high. In fact, the skunk doesn't care at all how much plant coverage you have in your habitat. So that will make it nice and easy. We're going to be adding little fences in to make these look like back gardens or this kind of imitating fences. We won't be doing it the whole way because the skunk needs to be able to move around, of course. And yeah, a few little garden type props in here. Uh, a little bit of fun, I think, will be hard with this one.
so we do actually have little baby raccoons in already and both of them are gold starred as well which is quite exciting and our female skunk is also pregnant so we're growing the skunk and raccoon population that's what that really fast little sprint is <laughs> over the tennis ball there but yeah i think this habitat has come together pretty nicely it's really the first time that i've tried to do something sort of semi themed with a habitat ever actually in planet zoo I always go for natural detailing and that sort of thing, but I've tried to make this one a little bit more interesting and hopefully it's come off. Kind of lots of little fun props like the little plant pots here, the hose on the wall with the buckets underneath it, a couple of trellises and of course the little deck chairs over here and the, the wound up hose and the little fountain bird bath prop. I know it's a, a, a plant pot, but to me it looks like <laughs> it looks like a bird bath or something like that. So yeah, really kind of pleased with how it's come out and seeing the raccoons actually climbing up and down the climbing apparatus at the back is super exciting and using the pond down here. Did add a little water jet and a sprinkler, again for extra entertainment, some bubbles over here. So there's lots going on in this. We have a ton of detailing to do around the outside. Now, I don't know how you guys feel about me doing little areas like this and particularly around this cafe area as well off camera or whether you would like to see them. Perhaps we could even do it in a live stream. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Because we're going to end up with lots of little holes like this. I can't pack it all into every single episode all the time. Um, I did just come round off camera as well and just finish off around here. So we've added in our little rock border using those aquatic rocks. Little tree here. A few more bushes around the picnic area as well to help that feel a little bit more natural and kind of hide where that concrete flows into the path network that I don't really like. So I think that's come across quite nicely. A few little bins around as well. But that is going to be it for today. So if you have enjoyed the episode, likes, comments and shares are really greatly appreciated. Keep those suggestions for what you'd like to see in the zoo or topics that you'd like me to cover as part of this beginner's guide in the comments below as well. But that's all from me for now. So I'll catch you again next time. Bye bye. <laughs>